I love this song and I haven't heard it in years. Hey Heather, you're first. She's Rando second. Anybody remember this? Oh, oh no, I thought I was gonna kick in there. <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome, welcome, welcome. Oh, there it is. Love this song. Golden Brown. Hello, friends. Hello. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody, to Conk's Corner. Uh, probably the second last installment, maybe the last installment of this book. We'll we'll see how. Uh, it's um, who is this again? Is it not saying it? Oh. Snatch, Golden Brown, on the soundtrack. I'm not actually sure who does it, but it's on the Snatch soundtrack. Sup, Cat Jack? Uh, you listen to the song a lot in high school, that's cool. Okay, so I'm reading Harry Potter every single day for an hour, if you're just tuning in, uh, to connect with you, and it's been going great <laughs> connecting with a lot of you. <laughs> um, it's been really fun. So, the last reading was insane. A lot of exposition, a lot of, uh, here's what I was doing during this time. <laughs> happening, but also crazy twists and turns that blew my mind. Whew, that was good. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, we're gonna go and we'll see how far we get into this today. Just a few things for people who were potentially tuning in for the first time. No spoilers, no hints, no leading questions of what I should be paying attention to anywhere in the comments because I read them every single time. Somebody made a suggestion maybe we should have a separate Discord or a separate chat or something like that. So maybe that's a possibility for the future. Uh, heads up, after I finish this book, I'm going to take a little bit of a longer pause. Nothing too crazy, but until I get everything set up, because I've been doing this in my free time amongst everything, and I just haven't been able to get it done. And now that Instagram is kind of messing up and losing some of the videos, and it's hard to post everything, I, I would rather wait until I have everything set up to continue on so I can actually safely save videos and everything, you know? So, uh, that's what I'm doing. If you want to catch up with any of the videos, uh, go to the link in my bio. You can catch up there. I've also got my Patreon on there, reading other books, The, uh, the Gold Finch and uh, The Illustrated Man by Ray Bradbury. If you're interested in those, check it out. Um, Mark's here. Yo! Uh, YOC.Creations, follow him on there. Cool. Uh, Dexter's here. He's, uh, he's been a little bit of a mump today, but he's licking my hands, so it seems like it's okay. Um, and yeah. I'm going to just get into it. How about that? How about I just shut up and start speaking? Let's turn this off. Let's turn this Do off. Do it already. Stop talking. Ah! Ah! My mother died! <laughs> That's what this, this, uh, the, the scar symbolizes. Is it empty? What's going on over here? Oh, it seems like it might be empty. It's cheap dollar store ones anyways. Okay. I didn't reread it. No, I didn't. No, you're right. I did not reread it. Okay, so... Uh, Crouch... Barty Crouch Jr. Just, just confessed to everything, basically. Everything in the history of mankind that he <laughs> did wrong. Um, he uh, blew my mind. He, did he blow, blew your, blow yours? I was, I was surprised. Yeah. Well, surprised. the biggest thing, the biggest re revelation was uh, Moody. Yeah. That that, and then there was a slight reveal of, but it wasn't really Moody. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, but that was the biggest. Yeah, for sure, that was the big surprise. Okay, chapter thirty-six. Oh, hey, should I be putting on some more tense music or back to the old? Ra -ta -ta -ta? You know, should, should it be tense now? Is it, uh, or, anyway, uh, that's, that's spoiling it as well. Yeah. Who cares? I'm just going to keep on going and DJ myself. Chapter 36, The Parting of the Ways. Hmm. Dumbledore stood up. He stared down at Barty Crouch for a moment with disgust on his face. Then he raised his wand once more and ropes flew out of it. Ropes which twisted themselves around Barty Crouch, binding him tightly. He turned to Professor McGonagall. Minerva, could I ask you to stand guard here? Will I take Harry upstairs? Of course, said Madame McGon uh, McGonagall. She looked slightly nauseous, as though she had just watched someone being sick. 
However, when she drew out her wand and pointed it at Barty Crouch, her hand was quite steady. Severus, Dumbledore turned to Snape. Please tell Madame Pomfrey to come down here. We need to get Alistair Moody into the hospital wing, then go down into the grounds, find Cornelius Fudge, and bring him up to his office, to this office. He will undoubtedly want to question Crouch himself. Tell him I will be in the hospital wing in half an hour's time if he needs me. Snape nodded silently and swept out of the room. <laughs> Harry, Dumbledore said gently. Harry got up and swayed again, the pain in his leg, which he had not, had not noticed all the time he had listened to Crouch, <laughs> which returned, now returned in full measure. He also realized that he was shaking. Dumbledore gripped his arm and helped him out into the dark corridor. I want you to come up to my office first, Harry, he said quietly, as they headed up the passageway. Sirius is waiting for us there. Oh, Sirius, sweet. Harry nodded. A kind of numbness and a sense of complete unreality were upon him, but he did not care. He was even glad of it. He didn't want to, uh, to have to think about anything that had happened since he had first touched the Triwizard Cup. Oh, I forgot to record because to uh, to Instagram anymore, so I can't read what you're writing. Ah. Okay, um, he didn't want to have to think about anything that had, ha that had happened since he had first touched the Triwizard Cup. He didn't want to have to examine the memories, fresh and sharp as photographs, which kept flashing across his mind. Mad Eye, Mad Eye Moody. Sounds like a, even like a, a, a Western character. Mad Eye Moody. <laughs> He's been around Wolf's Ridge lately. <laughs> wolf's Ridge. Yeah, a lot of wolves on that ridge. <laughs> Mad Eye Moody inside the trunk. Wormtail slumped on the ground, cradling his stump of an arm. Voldemort rising from the steaming cauldron. Cedric. Dead. Cedric asking to be returned to his parents. Professor, Harry mumbled, where are Mr. and Mrs. Diggory? They are with Professor Sprout, said Dumbledore. His voice, which had been so calm through, throughout the interrogation of Barty Crouch, shook very slightly for the first time. She was head of Cedric's house, sir, and knew him best. They had reached the stone gargoyle. Dumbledore gave the password. It sprang aside, and he and Harry went up the moving spiral staircase to the oak door. Dumbledore pushed it open. Sirius was standing there. His face was white and gaunt as it had been when he had escaped Azkaban. In one swift movement, he had crossed the room. Harry, are you all right? I knew it. I knew something like this. What happened? His hand shook as he helped Harry into a chair in front of the desk. What happened? he asked, more urgently. Dumbledore began to tell Sirius everything Barty Crouch had said. Harry was only half listening. So tired, every bone in his body was aching. He wanted nothing more than to sit here, undisturbed, for hours and hours, until he fell asleep and didn't have to think or feel anymore. Harry Potter and the Deathly Shaking Out of Blood Loss? <laughs> Harry Potter and the Septic Leg. Oh, no. There was a soft, a soft, a, there was a soft rush of wings. Fox, the f phoenix, had left his perch, flown across the office, and landed on Harry's knee. Hello, Fox," said Harry quietly. He stroked the phoenix's beautiful scarlet and gold plumage. Fox blinked peacefully at him. There was something comforting about his warm weight. Dumbledore had stopped talking. He sat down opposite Harry beside his desk. He was looking at Harry, who avoided his eyes. Dumbledore was going to question him. He was going to make Harry rel relive everything. I need to know what happened after you touched the port key in the maze, Harry, said Dumbledore. We can leave. We can leave that till morning, can't we, Dumbledore? said Sirius harshly. He had put a hand on Harry's shoulder. Let him have a sleep. Let him rest. Oh, he's such a good godfather. Harry felt a rush of gratitude towards Sirius, but Dumbledore took no notice of Sirius' words. 
He le leant forward towards Harry. Very unwill unwillingly, Harry raised his head and looked into those blue eyes. If I thought I could help you, said D Dumbledore said gently, by putting you into an enchanted sleep and allowing you to postpone the moment when you would have to think about what, had ha what has happened tonight, I would do it, but I know better. Numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it. You have shown bravery beyond anything I could have expected of you. I ask you to demonstrate your courage one more time. I ask you to tell us what happened. The phoenix left out one soft, quavering note. It shivered in the air, and Harry felt as though a drop of hot liquid had slipped down his throat into his stomach, warming him and strengthening him. He took a deep breath and began to tell them. As he spoke, visions of everything that had passed that night seemed to rise before his eyes. He saw the sparkling surface of the potion which had revived Voldemort. He saw the Death Eaters apparating between the graves around them. He saw Cedric's body lying on the ground beside the cup. Once or twice, Sirius made a noise as though about to say something, his hand still, still tight on Harry's shoulder. But Dumbledore raised his hand to stop him, and Harry was glad of this, because it was easier to keep going now to keep going now he had started. It was even a relief. He felt almost as though something poisonous was being extracted from him. It was costing him every bit of determination he had to keep talking, yet he sensed that once he had finished, he would feel better. When Harry told of Wormtail piercing his arm with a dagger, however, Sirius let out a v uh, v vehement, 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 vehement. Yeah. That word has always boggled me. Sirius let out a vehement exc exclamation, and Dumbledore stood up so quickly that Harry started. Dumbledore walked around the desk and told Harry to stretch out his arm. Harry showed them both the place where his robes were torn and the cuts beneath them. He said my blood would make him stronger than, it, than if he'd used someone else's, Harry told Dumbledore. He said the protection my, my mother left in me, he'd have it too. And he was right. He could touch me without hurting himself. He touched my face. For a fleeting instant, Harry thought he saw a gleam of something like triumph in Dumbledore's eyes. But next second, Harry was sure he had imagined it. For when Dumbledore had returned to his seat behind the desk, he looked as old and weary as Harry had ever seen him. Very well, he said, sitting down again. Voldemort has overcome that particular barrier. Harry, continue, please. Harry went on. He explained how Voldemort had emerged from the cauldron and told them all he could remember of uh, told them all he could remember of Voldemort's speech to the Death Eaters. Then he told Voldemort then he told how Voldemort had untied him, returned his wand to him, and prepared to duel. But when he reached the part where the golden beam of light had connected his and Voldemort's wands, he found his throat obstructed. He tried to keep talking, but the memories of what had come out of Voldemort's wand were flooding into his mind. He could see Cedric emerging, see the, see the old man, Bertha Jorkins, his mother, his father. He was glad when Sirius broke the silence. The one's connected, he said, looking from Harry to Dumbledore. Why? Harry looked up again at Dumbledore, on whose face there was an arrested look. Mm. Puri incantatem, he muttered. His eyes gazed into Harry's. Uh, what, what was that spell again? Uh, please let us know what that spell is again. Priori incantatem. incantatem. His eyes gazed into Harry's, and it was almost as though an invisible beam of understanding shot between them. The reverse spell effect, said Sirius sharply. Exactly, said Dumbledore. Harry's wand and Voldemort's wand share cores. Each of them contains a feather from the tails of the same phoenix. 
this phoenix, in fact, it lets you know it lets you know the last spell a wand did did. Okay, so both there have the phoenix feathers in the wand. But I, yeah, we knew that they had the same phoenix feather, or the but same, not fo full. But we didn't know it was foxes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Keep reading. Keep reading. <laughs> I'll read. Don't worry. Uh. Uh, he added, and he pointed at the scarlet and gold bird, perched peacefully on Harry's knee. My once feather came from Fawkes, Harry said, amazed. Yes, said Dumbledore. Mr. Ollivander wrote me to tell you, uh, to, to tell me you had brought the second wand, bought the second wand, the moment you left his shop four years ago. So what happens when a wand meets its brother, said Sirius. They will not work properly against each other, said Dumbledore. Oh. If, however, the owner of the wands force the wands to do battle, a very rare effect will take place. One of those wands will force the other to regurgitate spells it has performed in reverse, the most recent first, and then those which preceded it. He looked interrogatively at Harry. And Harry nodded. Which means, said Dumbledore slowly, his eyes upon Harry's face, that some form of Cedric must have reappeared. Harry nodded again. Diggory, get back to life, said Sirius sharply. No spell can reawaken the dead, said Dumbledore heavily. heavily. All that would have happened is a kind of reverse echo, a shadow of a living Cedric would have emerged from the wand. Am I correct, Harry? He spoke to me, Harry said. He was suddenly shaking again. The, the ghost Cedric, or whatever he was, spoke. An echo, said Dumbledore, which retained Cedric's appearance and character. I am guessing other such forms appeared. Less recent victims of Voldemort's wand an old man, Harry said, his throat still constricted. Bertha Jorkins and your parents, said Dumbledore quietly. Yes, said Harry. Serious grip on Harry's shoulder was now so tight it was painful. The last murders the wand performed, said Dumbledore, nodding. In reverse order, more would have appeared, of course, had you maintained the connection? Very well, Harry. These echoes, these shadows, what did they do? Harry described how the figures which had, re which had emerged from the wand had prowled the edges of the golden web, how Voldemort had seemed to fear them, how the shadow of Harry's father had told him what to do, how Cedric's had made his, its final request. At this point, Harry found he could not continue. He looked around at Sirius and saw that he had his face in his hands. Harry suddenly became aware that Fawkes had left his knee. The phoenix had fluttered to the floor. It was resting its beautiful head against Harry's injured leg, and thick, pearly tears were falling from its eyes in onto the wound left by the spider. Thank you, Fox. Yeah. <laughs> the pain vanished. The skin mended. His leg was repaired. Oh, that's sweet. Yeah, he's just bleeding out. Yeah, nobody's doing anything and Fox is like, this kid is dying. Yeah. <laughs> Harry Potter and the ongoing backstory. Indeed, Lois. <laughs> I will say it again, said Dumbledore, as the phoenix rose into the air and resettled itself upon the perch beside the door. You have shown bravery beyond anything I could have expected of you tonight. Harry, you have shown bravery equal, equal to those who died fighting Voldemort at the height of his powers. You have shouldered a grown wizard's burden and found yourself equal to it. And you have now given us all, uh, and you have now given us all we, ha we have a right to expect. Typo. You will come with me to the hospital wing. I do not want you returning to the dormitory tonight. A sleeping potion and some peace. Serious. Would you like to stay with him? 
Sirius nodded and stood up. He transformed back into the great black dog and walked with Harry and Dumbledore out of the office, accompanying them down a flight of stairs to the hospital wing. Sirius nodded and stood up. He transformed back into the great black dog and walked with Harry and Dumbledore out of the office. Um, sorry. Accompanying them down a flight of stairs to the, to the hospital wing. It's a bit loud, sorry. There we go. Um, where were we? So, so sorry about this. Uh, when Dumbledore pushed the door open, Harry saw Mrs. Weasley, Bill, Ron, and Hermione grouped around a har har harassed-looking Madame Pomfrey. They appeared to be demanding to know where Harry was and what had happened to him. All of them whipped around as Harry, Dumbledore, and the black dog entered, and Mrs. Weasley let out a kind of muffled scream. Oh, Harry! Oh, Harry! <laughs> she started to hurry towards him, but Dumbledore moved between them. Molly, he said, holding up a hand. Please listen to me for a moment. Harry has been through a terrible or ordeal tonight. He has just had to relive it for me. What he needs now is sleep and peace and quiet. If he would like you all to stay with him, he added, looking around at Ron, Hermione, and Bill, too. You may do so, but I do not want you question questioning him until he is ready to answer, and certainly not this evening. Mrs. Weasley nodded. She was very white. <laughs> I've questioned him enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she rounded on Ron, Hermione, and Bill, as though they were being no nosy, and hissed. Did you hear? He needs quiet. <laughs> Headmaster, said Madame Pomfrey, staring at the great black dog that was serious. May I ask what... This dog will be remaining with Harry for a while, said Dumbledore simply. I assure you, he's extremely well trained. Harry... I will wait while you get into bed. Harry felt an inexpressible sense of gratitude to Dumbledore for asking the others not to question him. To question him. It wasn't as though he didn't want them to uh, want them there, but th but the thought of explaining it all over again, the idea of re reliving it one more time, was more than he could stand. I will be back to see you as soon as I have met with Fudge, Harry," said Dumbledore. I would like you to remain here tomorrow until I've spoken to the school. He left. As Madame Pomfrey led Harry to a nearby bed, he caught sight of the real Moody lying motionless in a bed at the far end of the room. His wooden leg and magical eye were lying on the bedside table. Is he okay? Harry asked. He'll be fine, said Madame Pomfrey, giving Harry some pajamas and pulling screens around him. He took off his robes, pulled on the pajamas, and got into bed. Ron, Hermione, Bill, Mrs. Mrs. Weasley, and the black dog came around the screen and settled themselves in chairs on either side of him. Ron and Hermione were looking at him almost cautiously, as though scared of him. I'm all right, he told them. Just tired. Mrs. Weasley's eyes filled with tears as she smoothed his bed covers unnecessarily. <laughs> She's so sweet. She is so sweet. I love her. Madame Pomfrey, who had bustled off to her office, returned holding a goblet and a small bottle of some purple lotion. She started creaming. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I was gonna make a stupid joke, but she says like creaming Harry's body all over. <laughs> Gotta do with all the new patients. <laughs> okay, um. <laughs> all the, the rest of them are just like awkwardly sitting there while it's happening. Um, should we go? No, no. Stay here, look. <laughs> okay. Why is she like this? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, just like. <laughs> that's how she smears it in. <laughs> uh, you'll, need, you'll need to drink all of this, Harry, she said. It's a potion for dreamless sleep. Harry took the goblet and drank a few mouthfuls. 
He felt himself becoming drowsy at once. Everything around him became hazy. The lamps around the hospital wing seemed to be winking at him in a friendly way. Ah, going to sleep? <laughs> Through the screen around his bed, his body felt as though it was sinking deeper into the warmth of the feather mattress. Before he could finish the potion, before he could say another word, his exhaustion had carried him off to sleep. Uh, breaking the chapter there. Oh, um, yeah, I guess all the exposition is over. Let's see where this goes for the rest. Uh, uh, my buddy Evan, he might be on the chat tonight. He, he wrote me and said, the middle of all the books is chapter 13 at, uh, no, it's chapter 13 and book number five. So we even haven't even gotten to halfway yet of okay. all the readings. Of, of the entire books, of oh, all seven books. chapter 13 and book number five. Chapter 13 and book number five is the middle of all seven books. So we haven't even gotten wow. halfway. Isn't that crazy? That's wild. Yeah. I thought we would have, yeah, I, th I thought it was like, oh, like, a, like three more books, right? But of course the first three are short, but that's, that's pretty cool. We got a whole bunch left, a whole bunch left in front of us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on to the next one. Wait, actually, uh, here's a question for you. What would you tell yourself 10 years ago? If you uh, met yourself from, from 10 years ago and you were some stranger, what advice, or not even advice, whatever, what would you tell yourself 10 years ago? Stay single. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Hillary's gonna love that. No, 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 that was the start of my last release. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I was like, ooh, that's a risky thing to say. <laughs> no, 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 at that point in time. Okay, I'm gonna give up reading. At least skip that one. <laughs> Harry woke up, so warm, so very sleepy that he didn't open his eyes, wanting to drop off again. The room was still dimly lit. He was sure it was still nighttime, and had a feeling that he couldn't have been, been asleep very long. Then he heard whispering around him. They'll wake him if they don't shut up. What are you talking about? I don't know. Uh, okay, let's, let's just see. Uh... Uh, Fudge, uh, uh, Mrs. Weasley and Bill. Okay, there we go. Uh, um, they'll wake him if they don't shut up. What are they shouting about? Nothing else can have happened, can it? Harry opened his eyes blearily. Someone had removed his glasses. He could see the fuzzy outlines of Mrs. Weasley and Bill close by. Mrs. Weasley was on her feet. That fu that's Fudge's voice, she whispered. And that's Minerva McGonagall's, isn't it? But what are they arguing about? Now Harry could hear them too. People shouting and running towards the hospital ring. What more? Uh, uh, regrettable, but all the same, Minerva, Cornelius Fudge was saying loudly. You should have never have brought it inside the castle, yelled Professor McGonagall. When Dumbledore finds out. Harry heard hospital doors burst open, unnoticed by any of the people around his bed all of whom were staring at the door as Bill pulled back the screens. Harry sat up and put his glasses back on. Fudge came striding up the ward. Professor, professors McGonagall and Snape were at his heels. Where's Dumbledore? F uh, where's, where's Dumbledore? Fudge demanded of Mrs. Weasley. He's not here, said Mrs. Weasley angrily. This is a hospital wing, Minister. Don't you think you better do... But the door opened and Dumbledore came sweeping up the ward. What has happened? said Dumbledore sharply, looking from Fudge to Professor McGonagall. Why are you disturbing these people? Minerva, I'm surprised at you. I asked you to stand guard over Barty Crouch. There is no need to stand guard over him any more, Dumbledore, she shrieked. The minister has seen to that. Harry had never seen Professor McGonagall lose control like this. There were... Angry blotches of color in her cheeks. Her hands were balled into fists. She was trembling with fury. When we told Mr. Fudge, uh, when we told Mr. Fud Fudge that we had caught the Death Eater responsible for tonight's events, said Snape in a low voice, he seemed to, to feel his personal safety was in question. He insisted on summoning a Dementor to accompany him into the castle. He brought it up to the office where Barty Crouch Wait, who? Mr. Fudge, right, right, right. Uh, I told him you would not I told him you would not agree, Dumbledore, stormed Professor McGonagall. I told him you would you would never allow the mentors to set foot inside the castle, but my dear woman, 
roared Fudge, who likewise looked angrier than Harry had ever seen him. As Minister for Magic, it is my decision whether I wish to bring protection with me when interviewing a possibly dangerous... But Professor McGonagall's voice drowned Fudge's. <laughs> the moment that... A thing entered the room, she screamed, pointing at Fudge, Fudge trembling all over. It swooped down on Crouch, and, and... Harry felt a chill in his stomach. <sighs> As Professor McGonagall struggled to find words to describe what happened. Oh, man. Maybe. He did not fin w uh, need her to finish the sentence. He knew what the Dementor must have done. It had, had, it had administered its fatal kiss to Barty Crouch. It had sucked his soul out through his mouth. He was worse than dead. I don't know, man. The Dementors are so full of anger and death and, I guess, coldness. They gotta be connected to, to Voldemort. They gotta be. By all accounts, he is no loss, blustered Fudge. It seems... He has been responsible for several deaths. Um, but he cannot now give testimony, Cornelius, said Dumbledore. He was staring hard at Fudge, as though seeing him plainly for the first time. He could not give evidence about why he killed those people. <laughs> why he killed them? Well, that's no mystery, is it? Blustered Fudge. He was a raving lunatic. From what Minerva and Severus have told me, he seems to have thought he was doing it all on you-know-who's instructions. That Lord Voldemort was giving him instructions, Cornelius, Dumbledore said. Those people's deaths were mere byproducts of a plan to restore, restore Voldemort to full strength again. The plan succeeded. Voldemort has been restored to his body. Fudge looked as though someone has, had just swung a heavy weight into his face. Dazed and blinking, he stared back at Dumbledore as if he couldn't quite believe what he had just heard. He began to splutter, still goggling at Dumbledore. <laughs> you know who? Returned? Preposterous! Come, come now, come, Dumbledore. As Minerva and S Severus have doubtless told you, said Dumbledore, we heard Barty Crouch confess under the influence of Veritaserum. He told us how he was smuggled out of Azkaban and how Voldemort, learning of his continued existence from Bertha Jorkins, went to free him from his father and used, to, used him to capture Harry. The plan Worked, I tell you. Crouch has helped Voldemort to return. To see here, Dumbledore, said Fudge. And Harry was astounded to see a slight smile dawning on his face. <laughs> you can't seriously believe that. You know who. Back. Come now, come now. <laughs> Certainly. Crouch may have believed himself to be acting upon you know whose orders, but to take the word of a lunatic like that, Dumbledore. When Harry told, when Harry touched the cry was at cup tonight, he was transported straight to Voldemort, said Dumbledore steadily. He witnessed Lord Voldemort's rebirth. I will explain it all to you if you will step up to my office. Yes, please, no more exposition. <laughs> I'm getting tired of it. <laughs> Dumbledore glanced around at Harry and saw that he was awake, but shook his head and said, I am afraid I cannot permit you to question Harry tonight. Fudge's curious smile lingered. Why is he smiling? He too glanced at Harry, then looked back at Dumbledore and said, You are prepared to take Harry's word on this, are you, Dumbledore? Shut up, you jerk. There was a moment's silence which was broken by serious growling. His hackles were raised, and he was baring his teeth at Fudge. Certainly, I believe, Harry, said Dumbledore. His eyes were blazing now. I heard Crouch's confession, and I heard Harry's account of what happened 
after he touched the Triwizard Cup. The two stories make sense. They explain everything that has happened since Bertha Jorkins disappeared last summer. Fudge still had that strange smile on his face. Once again, he glanced at Harry before answering, You are prepared to believe that Lord Voldemort has returned, he's saying his name, on the word of a lunatic murderer and a boy who... <laughs> well, Fudge shot Harry another look, and Harry suddenly understood. You've been reading Rita Skeeter, Mr. Fudge, he said quietly. Ron, Hermione, Mrs. Weasley, and Bill all jumped. None of them had realized that Harry was awake. Fudge reddened slightly, but a defiant and obstinate look came over his face. And if I have, he said, looking at Dumbledore, if I have discovered that you've been keeping certain facts about the boy very quiet, a parcel mouth, eh? And having funny terms all over the place? I assume that you are referring to the pains Harry has been experiencing in his scar, said Dumbledore coolly. You admit that he has been having those pains, then, said Fudge quickly. Headaches, nightmares, possibly hallucinations. Listen to me, Cornelius, said Dumbledore, taking a step towards Fudge. And once again, he seemed to radiate that indefinable sense of power that Harry had felt after Dumbledore, Dumbledore had stunned young Crouch. Crouch. Harry is as sane as you or I. That scar upon his forehead has not addled his brains. I believe it hurts him when Lord Voldemort is close by or feeling particularly murderous. Fudge had taken half a step back from Dumbledore, but he looked no less stubborn. You'll forgive me, Dumbledore, but I've heard a curse scar acting as an alarm before bell before. Look, I saw Voldemort come back, Harry shouted. He tried to get out of bed again, but Mrs. Weasley forced him back. I saw the Death Eaters. I can give you their names. Lucio, Lucius Malfoy. Snape made a, made a sudden movement, but as Harry looked at him, Snape's eyes flew back to Fudge. Malfoy was cleared, said Fudge, visibly affronted. A very old family, don donations to excellent causes. McNair, Harry continued, also cleared, no working for the minist now working for the ministry. Av Avery, not Crabbe, Goyle. You are merely repeating the names of those who are acquitted of being Death Eaters 13 years ago, said D Fudge angrily. You, uh, you could have found these names in an old reports of the trials. For heaven's sake, Dumbledore, the boy was full of some crackpot story at the end of last year, too. His tales are getting taller and you are still swallowing them. The boy who talks to snakes, Dumbledore. And you still think he's trustworthy. You fool! Professor McGonagall cry, cried. Cedric Diggory! Mr. Crouch! These deaths were not random work of a lunatic. I see no evidence to the contrary! Shouted Fudge. This is so crazy. Come on! Stupid Fudge. I want to put his head in a... In a thing that you just turn and crush. A meat grinder. <laughs> a meat grinder. That's even more intense. That's what. That's what it is. You turn and crush things. <laughs> I meant a clamp. What? <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. Harry couldn't believe what he was hearing. I don't. Now matching her anger, his face purpling. It seems to me that you are all determined to start a panic that will destabilize everything we have worked for these last 13 years. Harry couldn't believe what he was hearing. He had always thought of Fudge as a kindly figure, a little blustering, a little pompous, but essentially good-natured. But now a short, angry wizard stood before him, refusing point-blank to accept the prospect of disruption in his comfortable and ordered world, to believe that Voldemort could have risen. I read ahead... Uh, 
Um, a plea. Wee, 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 wee. Okay, let's go. Uh, Voldemort has returned, Dumbledore repeated. If you accept that fact straight away, Fudge, and take the necessary measures, we may still be able to save the situation. The first and most essential step is to remove Azkaban from the control of the Dementors. Preposterous! shouted Fudge again. Remove the Dementors! I'd be kicked out of office for suggesting it! Half of us only feel safe in our beds at night because we know the Dementors are standing guard at Azkaban. <sighs> oh, man. Insufferable. I know, he's so annoying. The rest of us sleep soundly in our beds, Cornelius, knowing that you have put Lord Voldemort's most dangerous supporters in the care of creatures who will join him the instant he asks. Oh no, sorry, this is Dumbledore. Sorry. The rest of us sleeps. Uh, the rest of us sleep less soundly in our beds, Cornelius, knowing that you have put Lord Voldemort's most dangerous supporters in the care of creatures who will join him the instant he asks them," oh. said Dumbledore. They will not remain loyal to you, Fudge. Voldemort can offer them much more scope for their powers and the pleasures than you can. With the Dementors behind him and his old supporters returned to him, you will be hard-pressed to stop him regaining the sort of power he had 13 years ago. Fudge was opening and closing his mouth as though no words could express his outrage. The second step... You must take, and at once, Dumbledore pressed on, is to ascend envoys to the giants. Envoys to the giants, Fudge shrieked, finding his tongue again. <laughs> what madness is this? Extend the, the hand of friendship now, before it is too late, mm, said Dumbledore. Whoa, okay, 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 wow. Man, I, I'm getting yeah. a bit dizzy shouting. Well, because remember in Voldemort's uh, diatribe, he told Potter er, that he was going to, you know, befriend the Dementors and the Giants. Right? Yeah. So. Yeah, let's let's get the, the, the Giants as our friend instead of his. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Also, uh, I was imagining Fudge going like... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Extend them the hand of friendship now before it is too late, said Dumbledore. Or Voldemort will persuade them, as he did before, that he alone among, among wizards will give them their rights and their freedom. <laughs> you cannot... Are you serious? Fudge gasped, shaking his head and retreating further from Dumbledore. If the magical community com community got wind that I had approached the giants, people hate them, Dumbledore. End of my career. You are blinded, said Dumbledore, his voice rising now, the aura of power around him palpable, his eyes blazing once more. By the love of the office you hold, Cornelius. You place too much importance, and you always have done on the so-called purity of blood. You fail to recognize that it matters not what someone is born, but what they grow to be. Your Dementor has just destroyed the last remaining member of pure blood family as old as any, and see what the man chose to make of his life. I tell you now, take the steps I have suggested, and you will be remembered, in office or out, as one of the bravest and greatest ministers for magic we have ever known. Fail to act, and history will remember you as the man who stepped aside and allowed Voldemort a second chance to destroy the world we have tried to rebuild. Insane, whispered Fudge, still backing away. Mad? And then there was silence. Madame Pomfrey was standing frozen at the foot of Harry's bed, her hands over her mouth. 
Mr. Weasley was still standing over Harry, her hand on his shoulder to prevent him rising. Bill, Ron, and Hermione were staring at Fudge. If your determination to shut your, hand, your eyes will carry you as far as this, Cornelius, said Dumbledore, we have reached a parting of the ways. You must act as you see fit, and I, I shall act as I see fit. Dumbledore's voice carried no hint of a threat. It sounded like a mere statement, but Fudge bristled as though Dumbledore was advancing upon him with a, a, a wand. No, you fear. See here, Dumbledore, he said, waving a threatening finger. I've, I've given you f free reign, always. I've had a lot of respect for you. I might not have agreed with some of your decisions, but I've kept quiet. There aren't many who'd have let you hire werewolves or keep Hagrid or decide what to teach your students without reference to the ministry. But you are going to work against me. The only one against whom I intend to work, said Dumbledore, is Lord Voldemort. If you are against him, then we remain, Cornelius, on the same side. It seemed Fudge could think of no answer to this. He rocked backwards and forwards on his small feet for a moment and spun his bowler hat in his hands. Finally, he said with a hint of plea in his voice, He, he, he can't be back, Dumbledore. He, he, he can't be back. Snape strode, for, Snape strode forwards, past Dumbledore, pulling up to the left, the, the left sleeve of his robes as he went. He stuck out his forearm and showed it to Fudge, who recoiled. There, said Snape harshly, there, the dark mark it is not as clear as it was an hour or so ago, when it burnt black, but you can still see it. Every Death Eater has the sign burnt into him by the Dark Lord. It, it was a means of distinguishing each other, and as means of summoning us to him. When he touched the dark, the, the mark of any Death Eater, we were to disapparate, and apparate instantly at his side. This mark has been growing clearer all year. Carcross, too. Why do you think Carcroft fled tonight? We both felt the mark burn. We both knew he had returned. Carcroft fears the Dark Lord's vengeance. He betrayed too many of his fellow Death Eaters to be sure of a welcome back into the fold. Okay, ex-Death Eater speaking here, huh? <laughs> Fully in front of everybody. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's this is another interesting element. What what how do you become an ex death eater? What happens to you, etc.? Well, didn't it mention that he like became a spy or something for the good team? I don't think it did. Did it? I think it did, yeah. When? I vaguely remember something about that. Oh, okay, I I completely forget that. No. Okay, um Fudge stepped back from Snape too. He was shaking his head. He did not seem to have taken in a word Snape had said. He stared, apparently repelled, at the ugly mark on Snape's arm, then looked up at Dumbledore and whispered, I don't know what you and your staff are playing at Dumbledore, but I have heard enough. I have no more to add. I, I, I will be in touch with you tomorrow, Dumbledore, to, to discuss the running of this school. I must return to the ministry. He had almost reached the door when he paused. He turned around, strode back down the dormitory, and stopped at Harry's bed. Your winnings, he said shortly, taking a large bag of gold out of his pocket and dropping it onto Harry's bedside table. <laughs> One thousand gallons. There should have been a presentational ceremony, but in these circumstances. He ground his bowler hat onto his head and walked out of the room, slamming the door behind him. The moment he had disappeared, Dumbledore turned to look at the group around Harry's bed. There is work to be done, he said. Molly, am I right in thinking that I can count on you and Arthur? Of course you can, said Mrs. Weasley. She was white to the lips, but she looked resolute. He knows what fudge is, 
It's Arthur's fondness for, for muggles that has held him back at the Ministry all these years. Fudge thinks he lacks proper wizarding pride. Then I need to send a message to him, said Dumbledore. All those that we can persuade of the truth must be notified immediately. And Arthur is well placed to contact those at the Ministry who are not as short-sighted as Cornelius. Making some moves, Dumbledore. Yes, love it. It's like a takeover here. Love it. Um, I'll go. Uh, I'll, I'll go to Dad, said Bill, standing up. I'll go now. Excellent, said Dumbledore. Tell him what has happened. Tell him I will be in direct contact with him shortly. He will need to be discreet, however. If Fudge thinks I am interfering at the Ministry. Leave it to me, said Bill. He clapped a hand on Harry's shoulder, kissed his mother on the cheek, pulled on his cloak, and strode quickly from the room. Minerva, said Dumbledore, turning, turning to Professor McGonagall. I want to see Hagrid in my office as soon as possible. Also, she will consent to come. Madam Maxine. Professor McGonagall nodded and left without a word. Puppy, Dumbledore said to Madam Pomfrey, would you be very kind and go down to Professor Moody's office where I think you will find a house elf called Winky in considerable distress. Do what you can for her. Oh my gosh. And take her back to the kitchens. I think Dobby will look after her for us. So sweet. Very, very well, said Madame Pomfrey, looking startled, and she too left. Dumbledore made sure the door was closed and that Madame Pomfrey's footsteps had died away before he spoke again. And now, he said, it is time for two of our number to recognize each other for what they are. Serious? If you could resume your usual form. The great black dog looked up at Dumbledore, then in an instant turned back into man. Mrs. Weasley screamed and leapt back from the bed. Serious Black! <laughs> she shrieked and pointed at him. Shh, Mum, shut up! Ron yelled. It's okay! <laughs> Snape had not yelled or jumped backwards, but the look on his face was one of mingled fury and horror. Him! He snarled, staring at Sirius, whose face showed equal dislike. What is he doing here? He is here at my invitation, said Dumbledore, looking between them. As you were, as you, as are you, Severus, I trust you both. It is time for you to lay aside your old differences and trust each other. Harry thought Dumbledore was asking for a near miracle. Sirius and Snape were lying, were eyeing each other with the utmost loathing. I will settle in the short term, said Dumbledore, with a bite of impatience in his voice. For a lack of open hostility, you will shake hands. You are on the same side now. Time is short, and unless the few of us who know the truth stand united, there is no hope for any of us. Very slowly, but still glaring at each other as though each wished the other nothing but ill, Sirius and Snape moved towards each other and shook hands. They let go extremely quickly, <laughs> like, like brothers having to make up. <laughs> that will do to be going on with, said Dumbledore, stepping between them once more. Now I have work for each of you. Fudge's attitude, though not unexpected, changes everything. Sirius, I need you to set off at once. You are to alert Re Re Remus Lupin, Arabella Fig, Mund Mundangus Fletcher, the old crowd. Lie low at Lupin's for a while. I will contact you there. But, said Harry, he wanted Sirius to say stay. He did not want to say goodbye again so quickly. You'll see me very soon, Harry, said Sirius, turning to him. I promise you, but I must do what I can. You understand, don't you? Yeah, said Harry. Yeah, of course I do. Sirius grasped his hand briefly, nodding to Dumbledore, transformed again into the black dog, and ran the length of the room to the door, whose handle he turned with a paw. <laughs> well, why, why that funny detail at the end? That's funny. <laughs> crap, crap. It was like such an unsmooth exit. <laughs> then he turned. Then he was gone. Severus, said Dumbledore, turning to Snape. You know what I must ask you to do, if you are ready. If you are prepared. I am, said Snake. He looked slightly paler than usual, and his cold black eyes glittered strangely. 
then good luck, said Dumbledore, as he watched with a trace of apprehension on his knee as Snape swept wordlessly after Sirius. It was several minutes before Dumbledore spoke again. I must go downstairs, he said finally. I must see the Diggory's. Harry, take the rest of your potion. I will see all of you later. Harry slumped back against his pillows as Dumbledore disappeared. Hermione, Ron, and Mrs. Weasley were all looking at him. None of them spoke for a very long time. You've got to take the rest of your potion, Harry, Mrs. Weasley said at last. Her hand nudged the sack of gold on his bedside cabinet as she reached for the bottle and the goblet. You have a good, good long sleep. Try and think about something else for a while. Think about what you're going to buy with your winnings. <laughs> I don't want that gold, said Harry in an expressless voice. You have it. Anyone can have it. I shouldn't have won it. It should have been Cedric's. The thing which he had been fighting on and off ever since he had come out of the maze was threatening to overpower him. He could feel a burning, prickling feeling in the inner corners of his eyes. He blinked and stared up at the ceiling. It wasn't your fault, Harry, Mrs. Weasley whispered. I told him to take the cup with me, said Harry. Now the burning feeling was in his throat, too. He wished Ron would look away. Mrs. Weasley set the potion down on the bedside cabinet, bent down, and put her arms around Harry. He had no memory of ever being hugged like this, as though by a mother. The full weight of everything he had seen that night seemed to fall in upon him, as Mrs. Weasley held him to her. His mother's face, his father's voice, the sight of Cedric, dead on the ground, all started spinning in his head until he could hardly bear it, until he was screwing up his face against the howl of misery fighting to get out of him. There was a loud slamming noise. Mrs. Weasley and Harry broke apart. Hermione was standing by the window. She was holding something tight in her wand. Sorry, she whispered. Your potion, Harry, said Mrs. Weasley quickly, wiping her eyes on the back of her hand. Harry drank it in one. The effect was instantaneous. Heavy, irresistible waves of dreamless sweep, sleep broke over him. He fell back onto his pillows and thought no more. End of chapter. Uh, okay, I'm going to finish it today. I'm going to finish it, but that means that this is going to be a longer break, <laughs> probably. Uh, yeah, I'm going to finish it today. So let's, uh, let's answer these questions in the last two minute, minutes. Don't add any more questions because I want to have time for them before the hour thing is, is finished up. What do you think the future will be like with Voldemort back and the Ministry denying it? Well, the Ministry won't deny it, I don't think, until, when, when it's more obvious. But I don't know how obvious it will be that he'll be back, so that'll be interesting to see. Yeah, I don't know what it will look like for Voldemort to be back. So, that'll, you know, realistically, I don't think he'll be back with an army until the last book. You probably find, find more nefarious and, you know, evil ways to br bring cracks into his opposition, I think. When do you think they'll use the time terminator to prevent Voldemort's re return? Eh? <laughs> Actually, but now it's in the Ministry's possession, isn't it? Well, all time turners are regulated by the Ministry, remember? Yeah, so they but need Hermione the doesn't have hers anymore. No. It was taken. Yeah. Or given up. That uh, is a little flaw there. But all yeah. time turners are in heavy regulation. Sorry. I, I got only a minute left for these last two questions. Yeah. Uh, thoughts on Bertha Jorkins get her own storyline, but we never really meet her? Um, I don't know. I don't, like, I feel bad for her that she got tortured, but, you know, we didn't spend much time with her, so I don't feel much about that. Do you? No, not really. Not really. And last question. Uh, what do you think of Fudge now? I don't know. I, I always thought of, of, of him as that typical character. Blah, 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 you know, that kind of pompous, uh, self-important, um, cares about his appearance and status person. So it hasn't really changed. Despicable. Uh, 40 seconds remaining. Okay, I'm going to log off and log right back on. Join me, okay? I'm going to finish this book today. hey -o, welcome back for part two of today's reading. We're going to finish off this. We're going to finish it off. Finish it off. Woo! It's going to be pretty great. Healthcare workers, thank you for all you do. Thank you, healthcare workers. You rock. You rock my world. You know you do. I don't know the rest of the lyrics. Don't know. Anyway, you're awesome. We love you. We're thankful to you. 
Huh? Didn't even get the first part of the lyrics right. You rock my world, you know you do. That's not even the lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, oh, and while people are joining, I, I forgot to mention that uh, thank you to um, Fjorn8, she's on there, for um, for supporting me on Patreon. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, let's keep going, shall we? I think most people are back. Few few people are coming. We've got, uh, how many pages? 16 pages. 16 pages till we end. It's crazy! Crazy, crazy, crazy. So long for all this ride. Okay, chapter 37, the beginning. The beginning? This is all just the <laughs> <laughs> this prologue? This is all just the prologue. Yeah. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. What? <laughs> it's all just been a trick again. Another turn. <laughs> and with Hermione's 700th turn on the time turner. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He, he was just a baby and had to live another 13 years at the Dursleys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. When he looked back, even a month later... Oh, month... Uh, turned a month forward. When he looked back, even a month later, Harry found he had few memories of the following days. It was as though he had been through too much to take in any more. The recollections he did have were very painful. The worst, perhaps, was the meeting with the Diggories that took place the following morning. They did not blame him for what had happened. On the contrary, both thanked him for returning Cedric's body to them. Oh, oh that's heartbreaking. Mr. Diggory sobbed through most of the interview. Mrs. Diggory's grief seemed to be beyond tears. <sighs> he suffered very little then, she said, when Harry had told her how Cedric had died. And after all... Amos, he died just when he'd won the tournament. He must have been very happy. <laughs> when they had got to their feet, she looked down at Harry and said, you look, up, you look after yourself now. Harry seized the sack of gold on the bedside table. You take this, he muttered to her. Should have been Cedric's. You got there first. You take it. But she backed away from him. No. It's yours, dear. We couldn't... You keep it. That's just the most heartbreaking part of it all. Harry returned to Gryffindor Tower the following evening. From what Hermione and Ron... Hi, buddy. What do you give me that side eye for, huh? You went over here? You, 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 feeling, you feeling my sadness when I comfort me, huh? Huh, buddy? That's probably what's going on. Hey, buddy. Okay. Let's get you a front row seat. He, 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 uh, he paid for the nosebleeds, but <laughs> I'm promoting him to front row seat. Okay. Hey. Harry returned to Gryffindor Tower the following evening. From what Hermione and Ron told him, Dumbledore has spoken to the school that morning at breakfast. He had merely requested that they leave Harry alone, that nobody ask him questions or badger him to tell the story of what had happened in the maze. Most people, he noticed, were skirting him in the corridors, avoiding his eyes. Some whispered behind their hands as he passed. He guessed that many of them had believed Rita Skeeter's article about how disturbed and possibly dangerous he was. Perhaps they were formulating their own theories about how Cedric had died. He found he didn't care very much. He liked it best when he was with Ron and Hermione, and they were talking about other things or letting him sit in silence when they played chess. Yeah, PTSD, for sure. He felt as though all three of them had reached an understanding they didn't need to put into words. Oh, is it okay? The little cough thing. Um, he felt as though all three of them had reached an understanding they didn't need to put into words. That each of them was waiting for some sign, some word, of what was going on outside Hogwarts and that it was useless to speculate about what might be coming until they knew anything for certain. The only time they touched upon the subject was when Ron told Harry about a meeting Mrs. Weasley had had with Dumbledore before going home. She went to ask him if he could come straight to us this summer. Oh no, Ron, Ron. She went to ask him if he could come to us straight this summer, but he wants you to go back to the Dursleys, at least at first. Why, said Harry. 
She said Dumbledore's got his reasons, said Ron, shaking his head darkly. I suppose we've got to trust him, haven't we? The only person apart from Ron and Hermione that Harry felt able to talk to was Hagrid. As there was no longer a defense against the dark arts teacher, they had those lessons free. They used the one on Thursday afternoon to go down and visit him in the cabin. It was a bright and sunny day. Fang bounded out of the open door as they approached, barking and wagging his tail madly. Who's that? called Hagrid, coming to the, do to the door. Harry! He strode out to meet them, pulled Harry into a one-armed hug, ruffled his hair, and said, Good to see you, mate. Good to see you. They saw two bucket-sized cups and saucers on the wooden table in front of the fireplace when they entered Hagrid's cabin. But having a cup with Olympi, Hagrid said. Olympi, Hagrid said. She just left. Who? said Ron curiously. Madame Maxine, of course. What? Okay, back you go into your haven. Back to your nosebleeds. Uh, you two made up, have you? Said Ron. Don't know what you're talking about, said Hagrid airily, fetching more cups from the dresser. <laughs> when he had made tea and offered a plate of doughy biscuits, he leant back in his chair and surveyed Harry closely through his beetle black eyes. You all right, he said gruffly. Yeah, said Harry. No, you're not said Hagrid. Of course you're not, but you will be. Harry said nothing. No, he was going to come back, said Hagrid, and Harry and Hermione looked at, up at him, shocked. No, known it for years, Harry. Knew he was out there, biding his time. It had to happen. Well, now it has. We'll just have to get on with it. We'll fight. Might be able to stop him before he gets a good old. That's Dumbledore's plan, anyway. Great man, Dumbledore. As long as we got him, I'm not too worried. Hagrid raised his bushy eyebrows at the disbelieving expressions on their faces. No good sitting worrying about it, he said. What's coming will come, and we'll meet him when it does. Dumbledore told me what you did, Harry. Hagrid's chest swelled as he looked at Harry. You did as much as your father would have done, and I can give you no higher praise than that. Harry smiled back at him. That's <laughs> so sweet. Everything's so sweet here. It was the first time he'd smiled in days. What's Dumbledore asked you to do, Hagrid? He asked. He sent Professor McGonagall to ask you and M Madame Maxine to meet him that night. <sighs> uh. Got a little job for me over the summer, said Hagrid. Secret, though. I'm not supposed to talk about it. Not even to you lot. Olympi... Oh, Madame Maxine to you. <laughs> Olympi... Madame Maxine to you. Might be coming with me. I think she will. Think I've got her persuaded. <laughs> what? Is it to do with Voldemort? Hagrid flinched at the sound of the name. Might be, he said evasively. Now... Who would like to come with the uh, visit the last scrub with me? <laughs> I was joking. I'm joking. He said hastily, seeing the looks on their faces. <laughs> That's awesome. It was the it, it was with a heavy heart that Harry packed his trunk up in the dormitory on the night before his return to Privet Drive. He was dreading the, la the the leaving feast, which was usually a cause for celebration when the winner of the Interhouse Championship would be announced. He had avoided being in the Great Hall when it was full, ever since he had left the hospital wing, preferring to eat when it was nearly empty, to avoid the stares of his fellow students. When he, Ron, and Hermione entered the hall, they saw at once that the usual decorations were missing. The Great Hall was normally decorated with the winning's house colors for the leaving feast. Tonight, however, there were black drapes on the wall behind the teacher's table. Harry knew instantly that the that they were there as a mark of respect for Cedric. The real Mad-Eye Moody was at the staff table. Oh, this will, this will be interesting. His wooden leg and his magical eye back in place. He was extremely twitchy, jumping every time someone spoke to him. Harry couldn't blame him. Moody's fear of attack was bound to have been increased by his 10-month imprisonment in his own trunk. Oh, 
Oh, gosh. Professor Karkaroff's chair was empty. Harry, wonder Harry wondered, as he sat down with the other Gryffindors, where Karkaroff was now, whether Voldemort had caught up with him. Madame Maxine was still there. She was sitting next to Hagrid. They were talking quietly together. Further along the table, sitting next to Professor McGonagall, was Snape. His eyes lingered on Harry for a moment as Harry looked at him. His expression was difficult to read. He looked as sour and as unpleasant as ever. Harry continued to watch him, long after Snape had looked away. What was it that Snape had done on Dumbledore's orders the night that Voldemort had returned? And why? Why was Dumbledore so convinced that Snape was truly on their side? He had been their spy. Dumbledore had said so in Pensieve. Snape had turned spy against Voldemort at great personal risk. Was that the job he had taken up again? Had he made contact with the Death Eaters, perhaps? Pretended that he had never really gone over to Dumbledore, that he had been, like Voldemort himself, biding his time. Harry's musings were ended by Professor Dumbledore, who stood up at the staff table. The Great Hall, which in any case had been less noisy than, noisy than it usually was at the leaving feast, became very quiet. He hadn't, said Dumbledore, looking around at them all. Of another year? He paused, and his eyes fell upon the Hufflepuff table. Theirs had been the most subdued table before he had to get to his he, he had got to his feet, and theirs were still the saddest and palest faces in the hall. There is much that I would like to say to you all tonight, said Dumbledore. But I must first acknowledge the loss of a very fine person who should be sitting here, he gestured towards the Hufflepuffs, enjoying our feast with us. I would like you all, please, to stand and raise your glasses to Cedric Diggory. They did it, all of them. The benches scraped as everyone in the hall stood and raised their goblets and echoed in one loud, low, rumbling voice, Cedric Diggory. I don't like this music right now. Harry caught a glimpse of Cho th through the crowd. There were tears pouring silently down her face. He looked down at the table as they all s sat down again. Cedric was a person who exemplified many of the qualities which distinguish Hufflepuff House, Dumbledore continued. He was a good and loyal friend, a hard worker, he valued fair play. His death has affected you all, whether you knew him well or not. I think that you have the right, therefore, to know exactly how it came about. Harry raised his head and stared at Dumbledore. Cedric Diggory was murdered by Lord Voldemort. A panicked whisper swept the Great Hall. People were staring at Dumbledore in disbelief and horror. He looked perfectly calm as he watched them mutter themselves into silence. The Ministry of Magic, Dumbledore continued, does not wish me to tell you this. It is possible that some of your parents will be horrified that I have done so, either because they will not believe that Lord Voldemort has returned, or because they think I should not tell you so young as you are. It is my belief, however, that the truth is generally preferable to lies, and that any attempt to pre pretend that Cedric died as the result of an accident or some sort of blunder of his own is an insult to his memory. Stunned and frightened, every face in the hall was turned towards Dumbledore now or almost every face. Over at the Slytherin table, Harry saw Draco Malfoy muttering something to Crabbe and Goyle. Harry felt a hot, sick swoop of anger in his stomach. He forced himself to look back at Dumbledore. There is somebody else who would be mentioned in connection with Cedric's death, Dumbledore went on. I am talking, of course, about Harry Potter 
a kind of ripple crossed the great hall as a few heads turned in Harry's direction before flicking back to face Dumbledore. Harry Potter managed to escape Lord Voldemort, said Dumbledore. He risked his own life to return Cedric's body to Hogwarts. He showed in every respect the sort of bravery that few wizards have ever shown in facing Lord Voldemort. And for this, I honor him. Dumbledore turned gravely to Harry and raised his goblet once more. Nearly everyone in the great hall followed suit. They murmured his name as they had murmured Cedric's and drank to him. But through a gap in the standing figures, Harry saw that Malfoy, Crabbe, Goyel, and many of the other Slytherins had remained defiantly in their seats, their goblins untouched. Dumbledore, who after all possessed no magical eye, did not see them. Uh, there's lines being drawn, man. At the end of this book, there's a whole, sort, whole bunches of lines being drawn, even within Hogwarts. This is going to complicate things for sure. When everyone had once again resumed their seats, Dumbledore continued. The Triwizard Tournament's aim was to further and promote magical understanding. In the light of what has happened, of Lord Voldemort's return, such ties are more important than ever before. Dumbledore looked from Madame Maxine and Hagrid to Fleur de la Coeur and her fellow Beauxbaton students to Victor Crumb and the Durmstrangs at the Slytherin table. Crumb, Harry saw, looked wary, almost frightened, as though he expected Dumbledore to say something harsh. Every guest in this hall, said Dumbledore, and his eyes lingered upon the Durmstrang students, will be welcomed back here at any time, should they wish to come. I say, to you all once again, in the light of Lord Voldemort's return, we are only as strong as we are united, as weak as we are divided. Lord Voldemort's gift for spreading discord and enmity is very great. We can fight it only by showing an equally strong bond of friendship and trust. Differences of habit and language and nothing at all if our aims are identical and our hearts are open. Ooh wee What an orator. Yeah. Man, what a linguist. This is, ah, I love him. I guess you could say his words are magical. You know, usually I make the crappy jokes and you scoff at me. I scoff back at you. Pooh! <laughs> Oh, how stupid, Lois, right? Right, Lois? <laughs> okay, gonna keep on going. It probably is gonna be keep saying even more magical things. <laughs> it is my belief, and never have I so hoped that I am mistaken, that we are all facing dark and difficult times. Some of you in this hall have already suffered directly at the hands of Lord Voldemort. Many of your families have been torn asunder. A week ago, a student was taken from our midst. Remember, Cedric. Remember, if the time should come when you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy. Remember what happened to a boy who was good and kind and brave because he strayed across the path of Lord Voldemort. Remember Cedric Diggory. Ah, oh, I want to die right now. He's just such a beautiful and oh, what a what a what a great man. Oh, see, I knew from the start he was one of my favorite characters. <sighs> Come on, so good. Harry's trunk was packed. Hedwig was back in her cage on top of it. He, Ron, and Hermione were waiting in the crowd, crowded entrance hall with the rest of the fourth years for the carriages that would take them back to Hogsmeade Station. It was another beautiful summer's day. He supposed that Privet Drive would be hot and leafy. Its flower beds are riot of color when he arrived there that evening. 
The thought gave him no pleasure at all. Addy! He looked around. Fleur de Liqueur was hurrying up the stone steps into the castle. Beyond her, far across the grounds, Harry could see Hagrid helping Madame Maxine to back to back two of the giant horses into their harness. The Boaton's carriage was ab about to take off. We will see each other. Uh, we will see each other again. I oop, said Fleur as she, she reached him, holding out her hand. I am hoping to get a job here to improve my English. It's very good already, said Ron in a strangled sort of voice. <laughs> Fleur smiled at him. Hermione scowled. <laughs> <laughs> so many lovey dovey dovey things happening. <laughs> Ew wee! I'm, I'm never gonna do that again. <laughs> Ew wee! <laughs> you literally just said you'd never do it again, and then you did it instantaneously. Because I hate it so much, I gotta do it again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Goodbye, Harry, said F Fleur, turning to go. It has been a pleasure meeting you. Harry's spirits couldn't help but lift slightly. As he watched Fleur hurry back across the lawns to Madame Maxine, her silvery hair rippling in the sunlight. <laughs> uh, wonder how the Durmstrang students are getting back, said Ron. Do you reckon they can steer that ship without Karkaroff? Who said this? Who's saying this? Um... Oh, Crumb. Crumb, right. Kar Karkorov did not steer, said a gruff voice. He stayed in his cabin and let us do the work. Crumb had come to say goodbye to Hermione. Could I have a word? Could I have a word? He asked her. Oh, uh, yes. All right, said Hermione, looking slightly flustered and fl following Crumb through the crowd and out of sight. You'd better hurry up, Ron called loudly <laughs> after her. The carriage will be here in a minute. <laughs> he let Harry keep a watch for the carriages, however, and spent the next few minutes craning his neck over the crowd to try and see what Crumb and Hermione might be up to. They returned. Look, look, Ron, you can't have your, your cake of fleur and eat it too with Hermione, okay? <laughs> you just can't, okay? They returned quite soon. Ron stared at Hermione, but her face was impassive. I liked Diggory, said Crumb abruptly to Harry. He was always polite to me, always. Even though I was from Durmstrang with Karkaroff, with Karkaroff, he added scowling. Have you got a new headmaster yet? said Harry. Crumb shrugged. He held out his hand as Fleur had done, shook Harry's hand, and then Ron's. Ron looked as though he was suffering some sort of painful internal struggle. Crumb had already started walking away when Ron burst out, Can I have your autograph? <laughs> Ron is really funny. Hermione turned away, smiling at the horseless carriages which were now trundling towards them up the drive. As Crumb looked, surprised but gratified, signed a fr fragment of parchment for Ron. The weather could not have been more different on the journey back to King's Cross than it had been on their way to Hogwarts the previous September. There wasn't a single cloud in the sky. Harry, Ron, and Hermione had managed to get a compartment to themselves. Pigwidgeon was once again hidden under Ron's dress ropes to stop him hooting continually. <laughs> Ooh, hey, hey, where are we going? Hoo, 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 hoo. <laughs> Hedwig was dozing, her head under her wing. Crookshanks was curled up in a spare seat like a large furry ginger cushion. Harry, Ron, and Hermione talked more fully and freely than they, than they had done all week, as the train sped them southwards. Harry, had, Harry felt as though Dumbledore's speech at the le leaving feast had unblocked him somehow. It was less painful to discuss what had happened now. They broke off their conversation about what action Dumbledore might be taking, even now to stop Voldemort only when the lunch trolley arrived. When Hermione returned from the trolley and put her money back into her school bag, she dislodged a copy of the Daily Prophet, which she had been c carrying in there. Carrying in there. You are so annoying, John, but I'm sure you already know that. Yeah, of course. <laughs> what do you think I'm trying to do? <laughs> when Hermione returned from the trolley and put her money back into her school bag, she dislodged a copy of the Daily Prophet, which she had been carrying in there. 
Harry looked at it, unsure whether he really wanted to know what it might say. But Hermione, seeing him look at it, said calmly, There's nothing in there. You can look for yourself, but there's nothing at all. I've been checking every day. Just a small piece the day after the third task, saying you won the tournament. They didn't even mention Cedric. Nothing about any of it. If you ask me, Fudge is forcing them to keep quiet. You'll never keep Rita quiet, said Harry. Not in a story like this. Oh, Rita hasn't write, written anything at all since the third task, said Hermione in an oddly constrained voice. As a matter of fact, she added, her voice now, her voice now trembling slightly, Rita Skeeter isn't going to be writing anything at all for a while. Not unless she wants me to spill the beans on her. What are you talking about, said Ron. I found, uh, I found out how she was listening in on private conversations when she wasn't supposed to be coming into the grounds, said Hermione in a rush. Harry had the impression that Hermione had been dying to tell them for a few days, but that she had restrained herself in the light of everything else that had happened. How was she doing it? said Harry at once. How did she find out? said Ron, staring at her. Well, it was you, really, who gave me the idea, Harry, she said. Did I? said Harry, perplexed. How? Bugging, said Hermione happily. But you said they didn't work... Oh, not electrical, el electronic bugs, said Hermione. No, you see, Rita Skeeter, Hermione's voice trembled with quiet triumph, is an unregistered animagus. She can turn, Hermione pulled a small sealed glass jar out of her bag, into a beetle. You're kidding, said Ron. She has her in a jar? Please say yes. <laughs> I, we don't know that yet. She just has a jar right now. You haven't, she's not... Oh, yes, she is, said Hermione happily, brandishing what? the jar at them. Inside were a few twigs and leaves and one large fat beetle. <laughs> Hermione, Hermione, Hermione. See, she's awesome. She's basically, ah, yes. <laughs> you go. Uh, where, where, where are we? Where are you? That, that's never... You're kidding, Ron whispered, lifting the jar to his eyes. No, I'm not, said Hermione, beaming. I caught her on the windowsill in the hospital wing. Look very closely, and you will notice the markings around her antenna are exactly like those foul glasses she wears. Harry looked and saw that she was quite right. He also remembered something. There was a beetle on the statue the night we heard Hagrid telling Madame Maxine about his mum. Exactly, said Hermione. And Vic so... I wonder when you go back if you if there's descriptions of a beetle everywhere. Mm, I don't think so. I wonder, maybe. Um, mm, 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 mm. Exactly, said Hermione. And Victor, and Victor pulled a beetle out of my hair after we'd had our conversation by the lake. And unless I'm very much mistaken, Rita was perched on the windowsill of the divination class the day your scar hurt. She's been buzzing around for stories all year. When we saw Malfoy under that tree, said Ron slowly. He was talking to her to her in his hand, said Hermione. He knew, of course. That's how she's been getting all those nice little interviews with the Slytherins. They wouldn't care that she was doing something illegal, as long as they were giving her hor horrible stuff about us and Hagrid. Hermione took the glass jar back from Ron and smiled at the beetle, which buzzed angrily at the glass. I've told her I, I'll, I'll let her out when we get back to London, said Hermione. I've put an unbreakable charm on the jar, you know, you see, so she can't transform. <laughs> and I've told her she's to keep her quill to herself for a year, see if she can break the habit of writing horrible lies about people. She's making her a bug for a year. Man, I love Hermione. She's awesome. Yeah, bugged. Nice pun. Um, roll, rolling. Smiling serenely, Hermi Hermione placed the beetle back inside her school bag. The door of the compartment slid open. Very clever, Granger, said Draco Malfoy. Crabbe and Goyal were standing behind him. All, all three of them looked more pleased with themselves, more arrogant and more menacing than Harry had ever seen them. So, said Malfoy slowly, advancing slightly into the compartment and looking around them, a smirk quivering on his lips. You caught some pathetic reporter and Potter's Dumbledore's favorite boy again. Big deal. 
His smirk widened. Crabbe and Goyel leered. Trying not to think about it, are we? said Malfoy softly, looking around at the three of them. Trying to pretend it hasn't happened. Get out, said Harry. He had not been near Malfoy since he had watched him muttering to Crabbe and Goyel during Dumbledore's speech about Cedric. He could feel a kind of ringing in his ears. His hand gripped his wand under his robes. You've picked the losing side, Potter. I warned you. I told you you ought to choose your company more carefully, remember? When we met on the first train, first day at Hogwarts, I told you not to hang around with riffraff like this. He jerked his head at Ron and Hermione. Too late now, Potter. They'll be the first to go. Now the Dark Lord's back. Mudbloods and muggle lovers first. Well, second, Diggory was the... F it was as though someone had exploded a box of fireworks with the within the compartment. Blinded by the blaze of the spells that had blasted from every direction, deafened by a series of bangs, Harry l blinked and looked down at the floor. Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyel were all lying unconscious, unconscious in the doorway. He, Ron, and Hermione were on their feet, all three of them having used a different hex. Nor were there the, the, they the only ones to have done so. That is, they were all just like, screw you! That's awesome. Um, thought we'd see what these three were up to, said Fred matter-of-factly, stepping onto Goyel and into the compartment. He had his wand out, and so did George, who was careful to tread on Malfoy as he followed Fred's inside. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting effect, said George, looking down at Crabbe. Who used the uh, Fernunculus curse? Me, said Harry. <laughs> Odd, said George lightly. <laughs> I use jelly legs. Looks as those two, who, uh, two shouldn't be mixed. He seems to have sprouted little tank tentacles all over his face. Well, <laughs> let's not leave them here. They don't add much to the decor. <laughs> Ron, Harry, and George kicked, rolled, and pushed the unconscious Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyel, each of whom looked distinctly the worse for the jumble of jinxes which they had been hit, out into the corridor, then came back into the compartment and rolled the door shut. Exploding, exploding Snape, anyone? Snap, anyone? S exploding Snape. <laughs> Um, exploding snap, uh, exploding snap, anyone, said Fred, pulling out a pack of the cards. They were halfway through their fifth game when Harry decided to ask them. Um, you're going to tell us then, he said to George, who you were blackmailing. Oh, said George darkly. That, it doesn't matter, said Fred, shaking his head impatiently. It wasn't anything important. Not now, anyway. We've given up said George, shrugging. But Harry, Ron, and Hermione kept on asking, and finally Fred said, All right, all right, if you really want to know, it was Ludo Bagman. Bagman, said Harry sharply. Are you saying he's involved in... Nah, said George gloomily. Nothing like that, stupid jit. Git. Git. He wouldn't have the brains. Well, what then, said Ron. Fred hesitated and said, you remember that bet we had with them at the Quidditch World Cup about how Ireland would win, but Crumb would get the snitch? Yeah, said Harry and Ross slowly. Well, the git paid us in leprechaun gold he'd caught from the Irish mascots. So? So, said Fred and Fred patiently, it vanished, didn't it? But next morning, it had gone. But it must have been an accident, mustn't it? said Hermione. George laughed very bitterly. Um, next morning it was gone, yeah. Yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what we thought at first. We thought if we just wrote to him and told him we'd made a mistake, he'd cough up. But nothing doing. Ignored our letter. We kept trying to talk to him about it at Hogwarts, but he was always making some excuse to get away from us. In the end, he turned pretty nasty, said Fred. Told us we were too young to gamble, and he wasn't giving us anything. So, we asked for our money back, said George, glowering. He didn't refuse, gasped Hermione. Um... Right in, right in one, said Fred. But that was all your savings, said Ron. Tell me about it, said George. Of course, we found out what was going on in the end. Lee Jordan's dad had had a bit of trouble getting money off Bagman as well. Turns out, 
He's in big trouble with the goblins. Borrowed loads of gold of them. They are the mafia. <laughs> the, the, those things are the mafia. That's so funny. That's so funny. They're like sitting in the corner. Hey, yo, where you got you got our money or what? <laughs> I love that so much. Borrowed loads of gold of them. A gang of them cornered him in the woods after after the World Cup and took all the gold he had. And, he, and, and it still wasn't enough to cover all his debts. They followed him all the way to Hogwarts to keep an eye on him. He'd lost everything, Gamblin. Hasn't got two gall galleons to rub together. And you know how the idiot tried to pay the goblins back. How, said Harry. He put a bet on you, mate, said Fred. Put a big bet on you to win the tournament. Bet against the goblins. So that's why he kept trying to help me win, said Harry. Well, I did win, didn't I? So I can pay, up, uh, pay you your gold. No, nope, said George, shaking his head. The goblins play as dirty as him. They say you drew with Diggory and Bagman was betting you'd win outright. So Bagman had to run for it. He made a run for it right after the third task. George sighed, deep, sighed deeply and started dealing at the cards again. Ugh. Things, John. God, that's why they are so mean to humans, calling them things. Well, technically, everything's a thing. <laughs> the rest of the journey passed pleasantly enough. Harry wished it could have gone all uh, gone on all summer, in fact, and that he would never arrive at King's Cross. But as he had learned the hard way that year, time will not slow down when something unpleasant lies ahead. And all too soon, the Hogwarts Express was slowing down at Platform 9 and 3 quarters. The usual confusion and noise filled the, the corridors <laughs> as the students began to disembark. Ron and Hermione struggled out past Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyelle, carrying their trunks. Harry, how, um, however, stead put. Fred, George, wait a moment. The twins turned. Harry pulled out on, uh, opened his trunk and drew out his triwizard winnings. Nice. Take it, he said, and he thrust the sack into George's hands. What? said Fred, looking flabbergasted. Take it, Harry re repeated firmly. I don't want it. <laughs> You're mental, said George, trying to push it back at Harry. No, I'm not, said Harry. You take it and get inventing. It's for the joke shop. <laughs> he is mental, Fred said in an almost <laughs> odd voice. Listen, said Harry firmly. If you don't take it, I'm throwing it down the drain. I don't want it and I don't need it. I could do with a few laughs. We could all do with a few laughs. I've got a feeling we're going to need them more than usual before long. Yes, I love that. Power of comedy, power of laughter. I love this section about it. It's my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, said George weakly, weighing the money bag in his hands. It's got to be a thousand galleons in here. In, in here. Yeah, said Harry, grinning. Think how many canary, uh, can canary creams that is. The twins stared at him. Just don't tell your mum where you got it, although she might not be so keen for you to join the ministry anymore. Come to think of it. Harry, Fred began, but Harry pulled out his wand. Look, he said flatly, take it or I'll hex you. I know some good ones now. Just do me a favor, okay? Buy Ron some different dress robes and save it from you. <laughs> <laughs> he left the compartment before they could say another word. Stepping over Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyelle, who were still lying on the floor, Covering in hex marks. Covered in hex marks. Uncle Vernon was waiting beyond the barrier. Mrs. Weasley was close by him. She hugged Harry very tightly when she saw him and whispered in his ear, I think Dumbledore will let you come to us late in the summer. Keep in touch, Harry. See you, Harry, said Ron, clapping him on the back. Bye, Harry, said Hermione. And she did something she had never done before and kissed him on the cheek. Harry, thanks, George muttered while Fred nodded fervently at his side. Harry winked at them, turned to Uncle Vernon, and followed him slightly from the station. There was no, no point worrying yet, he told himself, as he got into the back of the Dursley's car. As Hagrid had said, what would come, would come, and he would have to meet it when it did. End of book four, what a journey. Wow, we did it, everybody. We got to the end of book four. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Wow, wow, wow.
That was a long book and what an adventure. That was pretty fantastic. Oh, okay, reflections, huh? I guess it's reflection time. I would say in the middle of the book, I was really enjoying it. Uh, I was really enjoying it, uh, but I still liked the third book most. And then it came to this end section and oh boy, it turned everything on its head. Yeah, I, this is now for sure my favorite book out of the bunch. It's changed everything. Uh, even like him going back to the Dursleys, like what the Ministry of Magic says anymore about you not know, being allowed to use magic outside of anywhere, it doesn't matter anymore because he's not bound to them. He's bound to um, to Hogwarts. Thanks for greeting, John. Thank you. Of course. Yeah, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for tuning in. It's it's pretty excellent. Um, yeah, that's gonna change. It's gonna change at Hogwarts now with obviously Malf. And what a ballsy move with with uh, rolling like making Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle also bad. There's like so much change, and I love that. I love when, uh, for example, TV shows, Ozark is a good example if you watch Ozark. Uh, things just happen. You know, usually you think, uh, some turning events that other seasons or other books would take, you know, a good couple of chapters to unfold and to, you know, will they, won't they, or whatever. And then things just happen, and the people and the book itself or the TV show itself is forced to deal with that change. I love that she does that. She's a courageous writer. I would consider her a courageous writer. Uh, let's answer some questions. We've got 12, yeah, and, th and thanks to Mark too, because it's still gonna answer questions, but Mark for being here, giving me uh, some questions and, uh, and spiteful glances when it's needed. <laughs> <laughs> and for Dexter, of and course. And thanks to Dexter. Yeah. Okay, let's answer some questions. Guy. Look at him. Look at him. <laughs> hey? Uh, you should do a full face scat next time. You mean like... <laughs> Why next time? I did it now. <laughs> uh, would you make a Facebook page so all the followers can get to know each other? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll do something like that. I'm going to make a note of it, okay? I don't know if it'll be a Facebook page, but I'll look into it and I'll create something like that. If that is a wish that people have, let me know if it's a wish. R write in the, in the comments. Let me know. Make a Facebook or a Discord or something like that. All right. What else we got? Um, uh, how do you think the Dursleys will treat Harry this next summer? Do you think Dumbledore would have written them? I, I don't know. I don't know if Dumbledore would have written them. I, I mean, I, I'm assuming yes now because you wrote that. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, how do you think the Dursleys would treat Harry? I think Harry will have the control, to be honest. That's what I think. What's your favorite way to annoy us? Um, you know, it all gives me pleasure. <laughs> it all gives me pleasure. But since uh, Marx is an extension of all of you, whenever he starts rolling his eyes, I'm like, I've hit the jackpot. Oh, God. I've hit the jackpot. <laughs> what do you think about Rita Skeeter and her impact on people, for example, on Fudge? She's probably a Death Eater herself, herself right? I mean, she's part of the Ministry of Magic, and she's she's listening with the Slytherins. So she's she's part of this whole plan. He's, you know, public opinion, for sure. Mm. I think she is. Good theory. Yeah. Top three favorite characters has not changed from Dumbledore, Hermione, and Hagrid. That order? Oh, if what order? I would say, um... Hagrid was your favorite for so long. I don't know. I really can't pick. I can't pick. They're all my, they're all my children. <laughs> they're all my children. <laughs> Uh, th those are my favorite characters. The voice is probably different. Uh, what else we got? We met a lot of new characters in this book. Who is your favorite to voice and who do you like best? Okay, who is new? Crumb, Carcroft, Madame Maxine, Fleur de la Cour were four new ones. Moody was new. Um, I think that's it, right? Do we have anybody else that was new? Oh, uh, Crouch. Uh, cr cr Crouch. Crouch. Karkarov. Yeah, okay. Bagman. Uh, Voldemort, in a way, was new. He became born again. <laughs> uh, born again Christian. <laughs> oh God. Okay, so I think my favorite to voice is probably Gakroof. He, he's really fun to do. He's really fun to, to do. But new favorite character? 
I think um, my new favorite character was probably Crouch. He was the most, oh, oh, or Barty Crouch Jr. When I say favorite character, I, I, I mean either I've like, I have some emotional attachment to them or they're extremely interesting. And he's very interesting, like how he man managed to do that. You know, sometimes bad guys do like a lot. Like I love Lockhart, he's a bad guy and stupid, but yeah, um, I guess Crouch. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe Crouch. You're just naturally predisposed to play villains, Jim. Yeah, hey. Has your list of favorite characters changed at all? I just answered that, thank you. Um, what is the real magic in your life? Me. Yeah, Mark. Whenever he, yeah, whenever he just appears in the room. My yeah. gosh. <laughs> uh, my eyes light up. <laughs> uh, I already, already read that one. Um... Do you even know how great it is what you're doing here? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate that. That's very nice. If you were Hagrid, what would you do in, with Barty Crouch, Senior the Bone? I would definitely um, break it in half. Wait, no, Senior. Oh, shoot. Not, 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 not Junior. Senior. Senior, I would probably, um, I would frame it or something. Or I don't know. What? How do you honor a person like that who... I, I find what he like what he was doing was not beneficial to anybody. It was you know actually horrible, but it was kind of honorable. You know, to his wife. I feel bad for the guy. I feel bad for the guy. Uh, what are you going to expect to, expect to happen in book five before starting it? Now that you've been finished book four, uh, good question. So I think there's going to be new. There's going to be a rift everywhere. Uh, the Ministry of Magic will try and hide it, but I think it will be maybe revealed, and uh, there will be new factions, maybe maybe a new organization. That maybe that's what what will happen—a new organization, not the Ministry of Magic, like the secret ops of the Wizarding World, <laughs> will pop up. Maybe that. Um, what else have we got? You see, you said the Chamber of Mystery. Uh, the Chamber was the mystery, and Prisoner was thriller. How would you characterize this book? Yeah, he uh, Mark asked me this as well. I would say it's like a it's like a, a um, M Night Shyamalan action movie. Because <laughs> the whole time it's like this crazy twist upon twist that all work at the very end. So it's like there's a, there was a lot of action in it, but this one uh, had this M Night Shyamalan twist to it. <laughs> and I don't know if you like him or not, but I love him. His later movies suck, but. All those old, all those older movies you can't say anything about. They're they're brilliant. I love them. Uh, I love when you do I guess a random exit dialogue. Would you ever do Harry Potter improv? If somebody organized a show, sure, yeah. Uh, are you going to check for clues in the book? You mean, uh, uh, reread it? Uh, no, no, probably not. Not now. Maybe at some point when I reread it, but not now. I'll just continue on. Do you feel like now that you are much more familiar with JK's style, yeah. that you'll be a little bit more perceptive next book and hone your premonition skills? Uh, I don't really need to hone them because every single one of them have been right. right. As people are observing and writing into the chat, yeah, they're uh, agreeing with me. Yeah. Now, I, I could probably add a little bit more detail to them, right? Right, right. And definitely, like, her <laughs> her, uh, her style, I'm, like, I'm thinking now... She is good at red herrings and throwing people that I put into my like true permission. Like yeah, exactly. Like I, like I said. <laughs> um, uh, Mark, are you excited to finally find out how the story continues? Oh yeah, because you only read till book four. Um, yeah, I'm definitely interested to know a ton of details that I never knew before. I know, like, I, I have seen all of the movies. Um, oh, okay. And so I do know, like, some of the more intense plot points. But, like, all of the other stuff, I have absolutely no idea. I couldn't tell you where the next book starts. Mm. I've got no clue. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, like, discovering lots. I expected some things to surprise me in this book, but I didn't expect as many things. Yeah, to, to blow your mind. This book. So, me too. I was just like, this is pretty great. So it's an awesome book. And then all these crazy things. Yeah. So that, like, that really makes me look forward to the next two. Yeah. For sure. Good. Three. Three. We got three books and we're not even halfway through it all. God. And this has been going on over 
I think almost two months. I think. Maybe even more. I have no idea. I can, I can look at the number of... Yeah, uh, we we started March 15th or 16th, something like that. So it's over two months. Wow, we've been doing that over two months. That's crazy, people. Um, uh, and why don't you apply to work for Audible? You've got skills. <laughs> Thank you. I, I am looking into voiceover stuff, but I'm just... There's so many different... This is. I want to focus on this project first, and then I'll move on to the next one. Um, what do you think that ministry will do about the Voldemort's Voldemort coming back? I think they'll do something that doesn't reveal it to the public to try and work secretly to, to research whether that's true or not. Um, if you think by the end of uh, by the end of all this, you'll be able to pick a favorite book. Probably. I mean, this is my favorite book now, over the other ones. Um, Dylan wants to know what you think the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher will be like. I think it'll be Moody, won't it? Yeah, I think they'll bring back Moody. That's my guess. That's my guess. Is it your premonition? No, this one's a guess. I'll tell you when I premonish. <laughs> I think that's all the questions we have. Yeah, I think so. Okay, everybody, uh, here's what's going to happen now. Um, I will be taking a break. And it'll probably be longer than two days. Um, during that time, I'm going to try and set up everything so, because what really bugs me is that Instagram has lost the video once uh, close to two, two, three times and I don't want it to happen. So I, uh, I'm going to take a break, set everything, everything up so I can film with my DSLR, use my c computer so I can save it normally. Um, so I, I will be creating a post to let you know when I'll be picking this back up again. It's not going to be very long, but I just need a, more than two days. Um, and, uh, what I what I ask is that for that post, please like it and share it. I'm going to say it this time. You know, uh, I, I like this community. I'd like to grow it even more. I want to do this um, longer because I really I really love it. And if uh, people are still liking it after these books, I'm going to keep on going. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for this great time. Uh, no, I, well, maybe Monday. I don't know. I'll put out a post and let you know. Uh, during this time, I hope you do well. Have fun. Uh, please know you are loved, you have meaning, you have value, and uh, give that to others. Bye-bye from Mark. Bye-bye. Bye from, from Dexter. Woo. Bye from from me, too, and my alter personal, my alt personalities. Bye-bye, uh, everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you, everybody. I will see you soon. Bye-bye.